Hello. I normally start the show with a joke, but I'm not going to do that this week because uh, I've been looking at the listener figures and they're massive. And I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who's uh, listened into the show and is listening into the show again. For a show still in its infancy, we're reaching really a lot of people, and that's uh, a real privilege to be able to connect that way. Londonist Out Loud receives no funding whatsoever, and whilst we're not looking for uh, freebies or donations, we are looking for a sponsor. And maybe you've got a project or a business in the capital. Instead of listening to me prattle on just here, you could be hearing the name of your business, and more importantly, so too could thousands of Londoners. It's a cost-effective way to reach a targeted audience. Just Drop us an email at info at londonistoutloud.com. Hmm. Yeah, I think starting with a joke was better. Let's try some satire. Politics. It's the start of June 2011. Hello, I'm N. Quentin Wolfe, and this is Londonist Out Loud. In today's show, urban gardener and writer Helen Babs will be describing precisely what happens when a seal encounters a swan in the Thames. She'll also be talking about green-fingered things. Blogger and part-time politico Tom Jones will be here, discussing Barack Obama and tuition fees, amongst other things. We've got music from Nigel of Bermondsey, and I'll be talking to the son of someone who was far too close to comfort to the 1936 Battle of Cable Street. Plus, we've got your Londonist Out Loud guide to things to see and do in the city in the coming weeks. That's all in your Londonist Out Loud. I'm here with Helen Babs. She's an urban nature writer and also with the author of the blog Tired of London, Tired of Life, Tom Jones. Good morning, guys. Morning. Morning. Uh, so we've had a busy fortnight. We've had the visit of Barack Obama, amongst uh, other things, in the, the last fortnight. Um, I rather got the impression while we were setting up for the show that that hadn't impressed you over much, in all honesty. The bit I got most excited about, actually, I was in Southwark, um, standing quite high, and I looked across, and I could see where Westminster would be, and there were two helicopters hovering, and they were moving very slowly, and you could tell that they were following Obama. I found that exciting, but I have to admit, that was the most excited I got. Air traffic. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was actually very excited about it. I always love a sort of state visit, any sort of state occasion, really, and I thought it was brilliant. But one thing that got to me was just the fawning of all, all the politicians trying to get their moment with him and Nick Clegg I think was the worst for that just uh, oh, really? a massive smile on his face like a, a child in a sort of toy shop. Uh, now you're involved in the political sphere aren't you in your real life? I have been yes. Um, so. uh, any sort of insights into this visit from someone on the inside? A state visit like that is almost politics in its purest form because nothing actually happens you know everyone goes mm. to meet him they have a dinner they go and play ping pong but actually what happens you know they do have a, a discussion but everything's been discussed before they're coming what what they're going to say and that sort of thing so so it's just people meeting and talking to each other as you say you know people get excited about it for that reason but there's no news it's not you know the detail it did seem like the politicians were also kind of like i got an invite you know that kind of showing off <laughs> and reeling off the people that they met in the way that we might if we spot a celebrity at some kind of event they were like oh and i saw this person and this person and they were standing next to that person and all seemed very wowed by obama does that put senior politicians in a bit of a weak light when you discover them uh, being so starstruck i don't think it makes them seem weak i guess it makes them seem quite human a little bit pathetic i guess but not in a bad way actually i think it's pathetic you know, in a good way <laughs> <laughs> they're not being argumentative or you know fighting for what's right they're more just going wow this guy's really impressive and just being quite overawed by the history of it all it's more pomp and show straight after the royal wedding really isn't it and i guess there's maybe a bit of ep appetite for that at the moment as far as pomp goes there was of course the attempt by barack obama to toast the queen which went off rather disastrously yeah well i mean i i thought he got bad press on 
on that because he he stood up to make a toast and the band started. If anything, I think it was the band's fault. I mean, I know he carried on. It wasn't just the band playing any old number, was it? It was, in fact, the national anthem. But, you know, we do things differently in different countries. I wouldn't blame him. I thought, you know, I thought the Queen did a very good job of trying to, to make the best of a situation by just saying, mm, thank you. But he'd seem to brush it off quite easily. I think the newspapers will watch like hawks for something like that to happen. And when it does, they try and make out that the, the Queen's family have been personally offended but I don't think she really took <laughs> took it as an offence I think she just understood that he didn't really uh, sense what was going on I think the Queen's got a much thicker skin than anybody uh, imagines exactly yeah somebody else who had interactions with Obama when he was here what, what do you think about this whole congestion charge uh, business oh, this is the story that Boris tried to present Barack Obama with the congestion charge bill for the embassy's cars because they don't pay of course and Boris is brilliant at this sort of headline grabbing and that sort of thing but it was pure press release and pure electioneering once again using a state occasion I think to try and uh, try and get his face in the papers you, and you say, you say once job. again what's uh, what, what are you thinking well of? during the royal wedding uh, I don't know if you remember he presented as a wedding gift a tandem of the Boris bikes to them as a present their wedding present it's good it shows what a good system the Boris bikes are but he should just he should more be proud of the, the system that he's put in place than he should be trying to use a, a state occasion twice in as many months to, to make make him look good i didn't know about the tandem that's brilliant it's absolutely brilliant but yeah you're right is it is it brilliant or is it a little bit tacky i think it's brilliant it is a bit tacky but tacky in a brilliant way (laughs) i mean they're they are actually quite an iconic design now i think Mm. like is in the design museum already and is that right yeah and it's it is actually brilliant for london and i think you know what on earth do you give the royal couple is it sponsored by Barclays? I'm sure it is sponsored I think by Barclays. I think we should feel more <laughs> cynical about that than. <laughs> I really admire him for doing it. I mean, I I didn't sort of question his abilities as a a politician. You know, I think it's typical Boris to go out there and think, right, what we're going to do, we're going to make the most of this occasion. And he said lots of good things. I mean, I saw him on TV during the royal wedding and during the Obama. It's that you know really really praising the president, and he's a big uh, fan of America. So I I I don't I don't know. I just think it's it's a a funny thing to do. Maybe sometimes he takes it a little bit too far. And also, you can be good at doing publicity stuff, and that's great. But it's the other stuff that you do that's important and maybe that's why we feel a bit more like hmm it's mm. good at good at silly gifts but maybe well this not. this is a good time to ask that exact question of course we've got the mayoral elections on their way is boris doing a good job as the mayor of london i think it's really difficult because i have to say I, I didn't vote for boris and i was really quite upset when he got in then the tories would get in when it came to a general election and I felt like that was quite a disaster, really, for London. But, I mean, on the surface, anyway, it doesn't feel like London has become a worse place to live. There are certain things that he's done that have been brilliant. For example, he's really done a lot for cyclists, and I think the the bike hire scheme is brilliant. But I guess maybe that is a publicity thing. I mean, my interest is in urban nature. There used to be a lot more people working on that within the GLA and those jobs have disappeared or been merged within departments. So I think certain areas have suffered. I I hope he's not mayor again. I think it would be good to have a change. I think he's a larger than life figure and he gives good gifts. But I think London probably needs someone who's a bit more... I don't know. Well, not a conservative, to be honest. (laughs) Well, I don't know. I mean, it probably won't make me a a friend of other London bloggers. I consider myself fairly centrist, and I, I don't mind Boris. I think he's a good chap. Ken was was a good chap when he was mayor, but people seem to suggest sometimes that Boris is, you know, just a figure of fun and and that's why he was elected. But more people voted for Boris when he stood for mayor than have ever voted for any candidate in any election we've ever had. So obviously they think he's got more to him than that. Um, Or or does that simply speak to people's feelings about Ken at that point? Well, I don't know. I mean, I think it's going to be a fascinating election next year. He'll be judged properly now because he was quite famous before. And I do think that his kudos probably got more people voting which is great actually because we need people to vote but it will be interesting this time because he has actually had to perform so they're really judging him now not on his have I got news for you performance but on his actual performance in office. It's interesting you mentioned that uh, things haven't been too bad under Boris in the last uh, week from Londonist we had the report that living conditions in the heart of London are not to be envied three of London's wealthiest areas seeing uh, levels of crime pollution and antisocial behaviour rising quite sharply. Uh, Tom you were slightly 
cynical about this in suggesting that uh, perhaps we should just expect this. It's a big city. All I, all I really saw in it from the report from Sheffield University was that, uh, you know, living conditions aren't that good in the centre of London, which I, I think we've all known. I mean, what we should be looking at is what we can do to improve them. I don't see as just having a report saying they're bad is necessarily helpful. You know, I think we all know that and, and we should be working to try and try and get the best for everyone. Quite so. And we, we were particularly pleased after discussing it a couple of weeks ago to see that Westminster Council has reversed its uh, decision on cancelling soup runs in that mm. area. And, and sure. of course, Westminster gets mentioned. Some of the uh, outwardly more affluent areas of London that seem to be mentioned in this report. I think it might be a surprise for people living outside London. I don't think it's a surprise for people living here because mm. it's very obvious that there's pockets of um, wealth up against really quite poor areas. I think the thing about air pollution is quite interesting, actually, because I was reading that London's not doing very well on its air pollution targets for the Olympics. And I do think that is actually a big issue in London. And we should be thinking more and more about how to make the air that we breathe better. Because I know, for one, that I've never had hay fever before and I've developed it since living here and I'm sure Mm. it's to do with the quality of the air as much as it is to do with the tree blossom but there's a lot of focus on why London's a bad place to live in some ways you know it's a great place to visit but not a good place to live I think London's a brilliant place to live it kind of annoys me reports like this in a way just focusing on everything that's negative London life is a really rich experience and there's a lot that's good about living here and even in those boroughs. Now, your book, uh, My Garden, The City and Me, which is out oh, just a few weeks now, isn't it? Yeah, the 21st of June. It's uh, all about, uh, I suppose, bringing together these ideas that people might think are in opposition to each other, naturally, gardens and cities. How are you going about bringing those things together? The book itself is based around one year on a rooftop in Holloway, which I inherited when I moved into a flat got a door that opens out onto a roof and I thought having no gardening experience that I would turn it into a little jungle and spending time up there I just started to see London as a kind of natural space just being more aware of the seasons of the earth of all that kind of thing and actually there's loads of green space in London or vegetated land and also river there are loads of rivers in London. When when you say green space are you bringing in sort of private uh, gardens as well? Yeah and private gardens are so important and they cover a fifth of London land which is massive and if you put that all together it's 268 Hyde Park so I think as people who own private gardens you've got an awful lot of almost responsibility but that land has got a lot of potential. London itself is really wild I mean, all kinds of creatures live here. Eels, seals, bats, owls, peregrine falcons, kestrels. I just think it's fascinating. You did and just more- say seals? I did. There was a seal in the Thames at Tower Bridge. It's not common but you do get them and it was there this time last year basking on a kind of raft sort of thing that had actually been built for a local swan and it, the seal kicked the swan off and it it spent time there <laughs> for a good few weeks a um, bruiser of a seal by the yeah it. but the thames is so clean and healthy now a great supply of fish it was onto a good thing a you green fingered top in february i moved into a house with a nice garden that I've, I've sort of been trying to weed and things it's shared with uh, the other sort of tenants in our block so we, we all sort of muck in but they're a lot better than me i'm sort of taking my direction from them at the moment what's the main challenge that faces the urban gardener that doesn't the uh, the gardener out of town for me mine isn't actually a garden so i don't have any soil or earth so it's kind of physically you have to bring everything in right i have terrible problems with squirrels i don't know if that's an urban thing particularly but the squirrels in london do seem to be very aggressive they literally shake their fists at me (laughs) and they eat my strawberries and they dig everything up so that's an issue which i don't know that people outside london struggle with particularly you you, you said you're turning it into a jungle uh but the strawberries too so what have you got growing up it's a it's food and wildlife friendly plants so at the moment, I've got lots of potatoes, garlic, strawberries, salad, beans, which are all things that you would just grow over the summer season. But then I've got um, things like lavender and honeysuckle, um, lots of herbs like bay and rosemary. Try and um, have flowers and things that smell good. And also have been thinking a lot about after hours gardening because a lot of the time you only spend time in your garden in the evening because you're out and about during the day so planting things that bloom at night or are fragrant at night like tobacco plant which will actually come out at night and smells brilliant but it's like this white glow that attracts moths so just thinking a bit about wildlife food and also making it a living room 
because I live in a pokey flat and it's actually a really important extension of my living space. And I was going to say that for Tom, like if you're in a, a house where you share a garden, it's actually the best way of actually getting to know your neighbours because it is difficult mm. meeting people who you, you literally live in the same building as in London. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree with that. I went to the Chelsea Flower Show last week, last Monday, and it was completely mad. It was it was what I expected in the sense that I thought it would just seem a bit surreal over the top. It's quite odd to be walking down a pathway, which is clearly a festival. There are trucks around and massive pavilions, etc. But then these mature gardens that have kind of been shipped in all in a neat row and roped off so you look at them and you feel like you could be absolutely anywhere but then you're surrounded by festival paraphernalia and it's it's almost like being in a strange dream when things have been reordered also a little bit frustrating because you're looking at these beautiful gardens but you're not allowed to you just have to stand back and look in peer over the ropes Mm, no Um, no sniffing then no no sniffing so you turn up in sort of urban chelsea Mm-hmm. And, and then where is this it's held? It's at the Royal Hospital. So actually, as a Londoner, that's really interesting because you don't normally get to go into the Royal Hospital. So it's where the Chelsea pensioners live. Oh, right. Very grand and lots of green space and they've got incredible grounds and there are a few Chelsea pensioners wandering around very polite good morning and ticket touts of a certain caliber as well I didn't get a uh, a ticket to go this year but I was walking past on one of the days it was on this week and it was approached by the best dressed tout I think I've ever seen wearing a, a three-piece suit and a straw boater um, and obviously <laughs> you know, just pitching to his audience if he'd been you know, uh, outside of the Shepherd's Bush Empire, I would have been wearing a band T-shirt and a pair of jeans. Uh, and I, I, I admired that him. I thought, you know, this man's got, got talent. So is it something that you'd recommend to somebody who's never been? I think it is, just because I think you probably have to have a, a, a minor interest in gardening or growing things. Otherwise, it probably would be a bit... Tedious. T- tedious, yeah. But... Um, I think as a London event, it's been going for over 100 years. It's mad, but it's fun. I don't know if I would become a regular, but i definitely go again. The book we uh, we already mentioned, the, My Garden, The City and Me, is by no means your only uh, sort of green project, is it? You're, you also uh, do uh, one or two other pieces of green writing, I think. Yeah, I edit a magazine called Wild London for the London Wildlife Trust, which is all about urban ecology which is great. Um, But a project I'm working on at the moment that's really interesting is called the Urban Physic Garden, which is down in Southwark on Union Street, just behind the Tate Modern near London Bridge. It's a medical garden. It's going to be open for six weeks. It's built around the hospital. So we're going to have different garden wards, which will be planted with herbs that heal. So we're going to have a cardiology department, for example, which we have plants like the foxglove growing in it because the drugs that occur in the fox club are used for cardiac patients today so it's all shaped around the hospital we've got an old ambulance that's being turned into a cafe we've got theater which is called the operating theater well there'll be all kinds of workshops loads of really great smelling herbs that we can cook and use in food there'll be a herbarium um, treatment room as an urban grower if you're renting you need that kind of portability with your garden i know for myself everything's in pots and when i move my plants will come with me so an idea i came across in berlin called nomadic gardening and it's all about creating a garden that can travel and i think those temporary projects are useful for that I'm here with Helen Babs, the urban nature writer and the author of Tired of London, Tired of Life, Tom Jones. Tom, we haven't talked a huge amount about what Tired of London, Tired of Life does. What's its mission? Oh, it's a website I write by myself and it quite simply suggests one thing a day to do in London. Uh, I have a real mix of things. Today it's a pub, you know, it might be a museum or a park or a statue or something like that. I just try and suggest one thing a day that you can see or do and research a little bit of the background to it and then present it on the blog every day so that people can read about it. And do you do all of them? I do a, a fair proportion of them. I, I, I've never really done a, a look into what proportion I do. Sometimes if it's something upcoming or something, I won't have done it, obviously. It'll be sort of a preview sort of style. But um, it started off as a project for me to write things down that I was then going to go and do. Yeah. So when I first did it for the first four or five months or something, I was writing it on the website, but it was I didn't tell anyone else about it. It wasn't listed on Google or anything. It was just for me to oh. sort of to remember the things that I'd found and see them and, and that sort of thing. It was a New Year's resolution, I think. In 2009, it was my New Year's resolution to write one of the day, and I've done one a day ever since. That's pretty respectable. Some people don't keep their <laughs> New Year's resolution for like a month, mm. and here you are, what, two years later? 
yes. two and a half years later. Well, I, I try my best. I don't like to quit these things. Do you get in touch with any of your readers? Yeah, I used to have a thing, and it just became too time-consuming, where I'd suggest a, a day's itinerary for you to do if you were in London. So that attracted a lot of tourists from elsewhere, from America or Australia or that sort of thing. And I still get contacted by people asking for advice, which I'm, uh, I love giving because it's, it's really useful when you go somewhere else to have the input from somebody who actually lives there. I think the majority of the audience are probably just people who live in London and just looking for things to do. And uh, I try to discover new things in, in a way so that everyone can discover new things. It would be remiss of me not to ask for a couple of prime examples so that we can keep ourselves busy in the next couple of weeks. I haven't written about it yet, but I, w- I went to Kew Gardens the other day for a research trip. There's so much in Kew Gardens you could spend a week there I think. There are various glass houses and there's a badger's set which you can crawl around in and there's <laughs> really? you know, various galleries, tea shops and that sort of thing. It's a brilliant place. There was a story on the 26th of May, so a few days ago, about six saddleback pigs that are currently on the loose in Holland Park in West London. They've been let loose, they haven't escaped. They're rooting around to disturb wildflower bulbs which are beneath the ground, which will encourage them to flower more. They'll pull out brambles and weeds, turn over the earth, aerate it, fertilise it. I think it's brilliant. It's a centuries-old way of maintaining the land. But how great to go to Holland Park and see them. They're handsome pig saddlebacks. And they're just mixing in with regular the folk. They've been let loose in a certain area with wildflowers. I imagine that they are fenced in. You'd have thought, otherwise you'd have people riding the pigs around, wouldn't you? Walking down Notting Hill gate. (laughs) I don't know how much interaction you can actually have with the pigs. I quite like to go and see them. I can get back to you on that. Yes, please. They've got big teeth though, haven't they, pigs? I remember almost getting bitten by a sow on a farm somewhere once. Really? Should, uh, which, yeah, big good biters have your arm off. (laughs) Bit of excitement in Holland Park. (laughs) Right. The vampire. Pig. Child attack by pig. They, they are a renowned way of uh, getting rid of the evidence after a murder, apparently. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, how come you know that? <laughs> no reason at all. <laughs> There's no link at all, really, is there, between this intuition? But what's. Come on, let's be creative. We've got three writers sitting at the table. What's the link between saddleback pigs and tuition fees? Hmm. I suppose you could be rude about the people who. Brought them in. What, what about you pig? Pigs, yeah. <laughs> that's just, that's well, you could say that get. students live like pigs sometimes, didn't they? Yes, we, we'd they get no them. letters about that. <laughs> this is the uh, this is the important news that LSE is not going to impose a massive nine thousand pound tuition fee. That's great news, isn't it? LSE is a humanities university. It doesn't have any science uh, sort of offerings and that sort of thing. So I can't think that they could legitimately get away with charging the full whack. They are nevertheless charging £8,000 tuition fees. They are, which is uh, a lot of money, let, let's be honest. I mean, they're a world leader, so I suppose they kind of feel like they have to if your Oxfords and your Cambridges are charging a lot of money. Isn't they, it quite remarkable that they didn't charge the £9,000 for exactly that reason? Aren't they suggesting that there's some sort of a... That there's the implication that they're a, a lesser college or something like that? Uh, LSE attracts a lot of people from abroad. Uh, a very high proportion of people who attend LSE come from abroad compared to some of the Universities, they pay a lot more in, in terms of fees, so perhaps they can use that to charge slightly less fees than the other universities. And I also think there is this argument that they are humanities universities, and so they don't have to provide people with so much kit. I mean, they've got one, a brilliant library at LSE. It's just paying for books, and a lot of the stuff is done online as well. Now, obviously, the periodicals and that sort of thing simply doesn't cost as much as if you're, you know, fitting out a laboratory for scientific experiments. Eight grand is actually a lot of money, so we're kind of praising them for only going up to eight grand what were they before i mean it's still a massive hike and i'd be very surprised if it doesn't get up to nine grand within the next few years they get maybe a little bit of attention for not doing it straight away but i still think there's a major problem that's just so expensive hmm. for anyone coming to london and having to pay that on top of living costs etc well, there is a difference in that under the new system of tuition fees you actually don't pay the money up front uh, you pay it after after you graduate uh, like you do with the loans i mean i'm not defending this system but no one when they come to london will be asked to actually write out a check for eight thousand sure. pounds and what about the burden of debt that that's then going to leave uh, students with how does that strike you i think it's quite unfair to say that you know if you've 
been given an education therefore you'll earn more etc etc because if you earn more you'll pay more tax and you won't necessarily earn more and I've got a degree and I've decided to write and therefore I earn very little but I'm still going to be paying off my student loan for awfully long time I don't think there should be an assumption that because you go to a good university that you will necessarily become a high earner Hmm. and if you do then it can be you know means tested in that way in the same way that income taxes that's an interesting question then Uh, what what is an education for if not so that you can secure a better job that's i think how we regard a university degree isn't it as a stepping stone to getting a certain kind of employment i think it's certainly how politicians uh regard a university degree in a sort of calculations and that sort of thing we should be world leaders so therefore we need the best universities education just as a concept is important and being educated and being able to appreciate things is something that enhances your life it's not about earning loads of money necessarily it's about being in, able to engage in good conversations be aware of what's going on interact with other countries and politics and all kinds of things it's not about earning 50 grand a year and it's about happy people universities should be places where you can really indulge in just learning it shouldn't be for a necessary end mm. it's difficult though isn't it because then there's a the question of you know more than half of people don't go to university in an ideal world we wouldn't have these fees but the people who are who are paying for the university under the fee system are the people who are going and should you know the more than half people who don't go the you know people who are working in tesco's or sweeping our streets be paying for the likes of you and but me to to go to university it is their taxes. proportional though you know you pay tax based on how much you earn and we all pay tax that goes to things that we don't use i mean you may, may never need to go to a hospital or you may never have a big issue that means you need a hospital you know it's, it's about not just thinking about yourself but thinking about the country as a whole and and therefore we all contribute and there's value in having educated people just as there's value in having people working in Tesco. Um, this is sort of tied in possibly to some of the stuff you were saying. You, you know all those things that you mentioned that have nothing to do with contributing to GDP. Happiness, ah, for example. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Bennett joins Brent Library's fundraiser is the title of this post on uh, London. It's in the last fortnight and we've got council go-ahead for Sydenham Grove Park and Crofton Park Libraries to be uh, run by a computer systems company. It already runs one library, but there's various closures in the offing, uh, Bear and Park, Cricklewood, Kensal Rise, Neesden, Preston and Tockington. Alan Bennett's got involved. What do you think about this uh, library closures programme that seems to be underway? Well, I moved to house in February and I haven't had calls to go to the library until last week and I went to my local library which is Blackheath Library. Uh, I took some books out and was told that I couldn't bring them back to that library because it wasn't going to be there anymore so that that was the first really? time it had, had an impact on me really. But the issue with Blackheath Library is they pay a massive amount of rent on the premises and they're actually moving it into the Age Exchange Reminiscence Centre next door. In its, the difference is that the Age Exchange Reminiscence Centre is wholly owned whereas the Blackheath Library just being there was costing the council a huge amount of money every year so I mean when you are looking at saving money I suppose you have to think about these sorts of things If people aren't using them then presumably there's a strong argument for them to be closed down isn't there? I think they have a a kind of symbolic value in that way and I think that's why people are getting worked up about it in that they're one of the probably few remaining kind of centres of communities that still exist like that kind of thing but more than anything it's that community space like the library is maybe somewhere where you might go if you were trying to find out about something locally it's probably got a notice board it's where there'd be lots of information about local groups and issues so I think they've got a symbolic value for local communities so when they disappear those hubs disappear I think lots of people have nostalgic feelings about libraries and probably the people getting worked up about it do and there is a question whether they're relevant to young people today I don't go to the library that often but I do every now and then when I need to get out a bunch of books about one thing for research and they're they're never quiet yes if you're talking about perhaps keeping the the social hub function of it it surely makes a lot of sense to be consolidating these different social hubs we're talking about but in the library in the age uh, in the in the age concern age exchange reminiscence age ex- centre what a beautiful can we have that one more time age exchange reminiscence centre yes there um, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense doesn't it we, do, we don't need to have this luxury of uh, of hard product moving around we don't need to be handling books we should be looking at things like that I mean there are community buildings that people don't ever really go into and I think things like churches or church halls or something like that they might be quite happy to give a space to a library as the Age Exchange Reminiscence Centre is um, 
Uh, and if we have to cut costs, maybe we should be thinking about moving things into those spaces instead. And it does already happen with public toilets. Public toilets are quite expensive to uh, to run. And some councils around the country have, have started schemes where instead of paying for the toilet to be run, they just pay a stipend to a pub or to a shop. And then they agree that anyone who comes in can use their toilet. And that that's saving money. So we just need to really think about how we can keep these excellent community resources, but not have so much uh, cost for the taxpayer, really. I think the books are important, though. I don't think we should get rid of the books. I was hoping you were going to say something <laughs> like that eventually. I mean, I think the books are. And also, I think that's the thing that pe- brings people in. So you need something quite that. Well, hold on. I can't, you've, you've, you've just asserted that books are important, but we've got no case going on here. Why are books but- important? Well, I mean, there's just loads and loads of information in them. You can't find everything on the internet. And also, it's a different way of doing a piece of work. I think it's a really good way of getting to know a subject is actually sit down and read a book about it. And you can't read that much information on a screen. Let me just turn to the blogger on my left. Yes, that's what I was going to say. Everyone nowadays, especially people I assume that you can get everything in Google, and it's just not true. I mean, there's so many, you know, there's books on on everything. If you if you go to a, to a deposit library like the British Library or something, you can get hundreds of thousands of books with all the information that you know mankind has ever ever thought of. Almost, we are unique in that we have a thriving business and shopping district in Canary Wharf, an innovative art scene, a first-rate university on our doorstep in Queen Mary, and a vibrant community spirit which has embraced different groups of people throughout our history. That's the case for Tower Hamlets to become a city. In 2012, it's going up against Reading, Blackpool, Middlesbrough and Croydon. I think we have to finish off here, but what, what do you think of this? Should Tower Hamlets become a city? It's a difficult one because, you know, you can see why they're, they're bidding for it to raise their profile and we have... So it's not a serious bid then, this is just a PR exercise? No, I mean, it, it is a serious bid, but uh, what I mean is, being designated a city, I, I can't think, you know, what, what difference it really would make to them, but um, I'm sure there are certain technical d- differences. But then you've got cities of London... Uh, and, and city of Westminster and that sort of thing within London that are cities so you can see that there is an argument for it but I, I was just amazed to hear that Reading isn't a city I, I would have thought mm. it was As we've been hearing with uh, our series on London Bridge in previous weeks the city of London was the city of London and then Westminster was an area that grew up independently of it this seems like a bit of a, a leap doesn't it this is a sort of an artificial uh, move to, to suddenly decide that one of the districts of London should have this status as well well, I think it's uh, one of uh, Lut for Raman, who's the new elected mayor of Tower Hamlets. It's w- one of his things, and he he is uh, a good a good advocate for the area. You know, he, he's keen to, to keen to try and get the best for Tower Hamlets and to get it recognised. So, um, so clearly, you know, that's what he's going going for here. Um, and you know, why not? I suppose. Oh, I just, I think it seems a bit silly, really, to have a city, another city within a city. I mean, I understand with the city of London and the city of Westminster, that's got historical reasons for why they are. But yeah. Uh, it, do they get more money because they're a city or better funding or something? I mean, I can't see the point, really. I think it's qu- quite confusing, actually, for people visiting. The people from outside London coming in will be going to London, which is a city, and Tower Hamlets is, happens to be where the Olympics is taking place or partly taking place maybe i suppose the next thing would have to be for the city of london and westminster to then become like super cities or mega cities or something <laughs> we have a whole league of different layers of uh, city nesses within yeah. the city it, yeah it's a funny one isn't it and, and i was talking about look for them and i think it is a bit of an ego exercise for the for the council there there as well you know but but you know that's their sort of job to to raise the profile of the area i suppose but um you know, just uh, it's probably as political as it is anything. <laughs>